abundant and full. Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard and not be satisfied with just a little empty religion in life. As our series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others influenced by the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. It's good to have you with us. We continue today in our series, A Living Sacrifice, as we hear about life abundant and full, about offering yourself. We'll hear from Rachel Saint, who spent many years with the Alka Indians, part of that time while Elizabeth was there. She had already begun learning the language when her brother was killed, one of the five missionaries in Operation Alka. That was Nate Saint. We'll hear her voice on a recording from 1958, that coming later. Right now, though, it's part three of A Living Sacrifice. Hey, what is it that gets us an abundant life? Is it that fancy car, that house, the new clothes that so many people want? Or will it always be a a little bit more? It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not be afraid or dismayed. That promise given thousands of years ago by Moses to Joshua is for you and me today, for all who are willing to follow the Lord. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking again today about a living sacrifice. The sacrifice that Jesus made for you and me was for one purpose, to give us life. It's life, abundant. We hear people say, I want to live. I mean, I really want to live. And, oh, that's really living. We look at somebody that's got a very fancy car or a beautiful new fur coat or a fancy house, and we say, wow, that's really living. Well, Christians know that that's not really living. Those things you can't take with you, and anybody who's tried it knows that they will never bring happiness. I remember a New Yorker cartoon with a picture of a man and woman, middle-aged, tooling along the highway in an extremely fancy car. And the wife, dressed in a fur coat, turns to her husband and says, since this lovely car has not brought us happiness, I'm thinking about recarpeting the entire house. Well, that's not the kind of life Jesus died to give us. It's life in all its fullness, life abundant. I am come that you may have life, that people may have life and may have it in all its fullness. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's from John 10, verse 10. When I visited a sheep farm in North Wales, I saw that the whole life of the shepherd was poured out day after day for the care of his sheep. Would Jesus, the good shepherd, do less for you and me, for his sheep? Yesterday I mentioned four aspects of the principle of sacrifice. The first is an offering. We do have the privilege, not just the right, not the responsibility or even the obligation, but the privilege of offering ourselves to God. Well, when I look at myself and what I have to offer to God, I'm tempted to say, what's the good of that? Or what kind of an offering is that? I don't know what you can do with this body, Lord. I don't know why in the world you would want me, let alone need me. Well, that's not my business, is it? It's my business to offer myself, just to come and say, here I am, Lord, take me, do anything you want with me. That's an offering. Now, acceptance. If I offer myself to God, I must also be willing to receive with open hands what God wants to give me. God gives us things which we don't think of as gifts necessarily. When I was single for all those years waiting for Jim Elliott, 
five and a half years from the time he and I had fallen in love in college until God brought us together as man and wife in Ecuador, I had a gift that I did not really relish. It was the gift of singleness. I had certainly never thought about singleness very much until I fell in love with somebody and wanted to be anything but single. And I certainly had never thought of singleness as a gift. But in 1 Corinthians 7, I am told that marital status is a gift. If you're married, thank God for the gift of marriage. If you're single, thank God for the gift of singleness. If you're a widow, and twice I have had to learn this lesson, thank God for widowhood. This is part of the acceptance that is involved in the principle of making my body a living sacrifice. I have to accept the circumstances of my life. The hard thing that is not according to my tastes, the thing I would never choose, those are the hard things to accept. It's not hard to accept when God brings joys and pleasures into our lives. When God gave me the gift of marriage, believe you me, it was the easiest thing in the world that I've ever had to accept. I was ecstatic. Well, God never gives us anything but what is for our best. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray, give us this day our daily bread. Last week, I came home from Norway, where my husband and I were on a speaking engagement. And as usual, I I pray in the morning, teach me to treat all that comes to me with peace of soul and with firm conviction that your will governs all. Well, those of you that have traveled to Europe and back know that those overseas flights can be pretty tiring. And I'd had to get up at 5.30 in the morning in Christian Sund when I left Norway, had to get to the airport, then I had to wait there, then we flew to Copenhagen. I had three and a half hours wait in Copenhagen. Then I had to fly to Kennedy Airport in New York. That was a nine-hour flight. And I knew that I was supposed to have a three-hour layover in Kennedy. And guess what? It turned out to be six hours. Well, that was one of those things about which I have to say, teach me to treat all that comes to me with peace of soul and with firm conviction that your will governs all. I'm not in charge of my life. I have offered myself to God. I have determined to accept whatever God wants to give me, and I'm going to accept it with thanksgiving. Now, wouldn't it be nice if I could tell you that I managed to witness to 10 people and I gave out 15 tracts while I was in Kennedy Airport, but that's not the case. I had, in fact, even run out of reading material. I had read everything that I had taken along to read on that long flight. And so it was sitting there watching people, trying to pray, which is not easy when you're in a crowded place, thinking a little bit, but most of the time probably my mind was pretty blank because by that time I was sort of, shall we say, zonked. But so what? No, Jesus was tired. He's been through this valley. He's been over this trail. And he asks us to accept with grace and simplicity, and even with thanksgiving, the things which we would not necessarily choose. And if we do this, offer ourselves and accept what God wants to give us, the third aspect of the principle of sacrifice is glory. Now, because Jesus was prepared to empty himself, to leave the golden streets and the ivory palaces of heaven, and the intimate fellowship with his Father in heaven and come down to earth as a tiny little baby because he was prepared to do that. The Bible tells us that he was given a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. One of those gospel paradoxes, out of his self-emptying, came his glory. Out of sacrifice, joy. And I'm reminded of the verse in Second Chronicles 29, 27. When the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also. I remember how deeply that verse impressed me. 
back in those days of longing for Jim Elliot. Somebody had pointed that verse out to me when I was a senior in college and had fallen in love with this man that I didn't think I had a chance of ever marrying. When the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also. And so I said, Lord, here's the offering of my unfulfilled desire. Maybe you want me to be single the rest of my life. I accept it. I offer myself back to you. And when the burnt offering began, it's true that God did give me joy. Now, that doesn't mean that there was no more longing for Jim. That doesn't mean that the desire to marry was canceled, but it was surrendered. It was a part of the material for sacrifice that God had put into my hands. Yes, that's exactly what I mean. My own longing, my feeling of emptiness, my unfulfilled desire was material for sacrifice. Do you know how to handle longings and unfulfilled desire? I don't. So instead of trying to handle them, I hand them over. And God gave joy. Joy in the midst of pain. And there's another one of those gospel paradoxes. It does work. It is real. And many of you have experienced that. I'd love to hear from some of you who can tell me specific cases where in the midst of what would be the last circumstance that you yourself would have chosen, a circumstance which involved pain, perhaps loss, deprivation. You knew the joy of the Lord, the joy which is your strength. And the fourth aspect of the principle of sacrifice is sharing. Jesus said, the bread that I will give is my body, and I give it for the life of the world. He's given to you and me one body each, one body in which to live our lives. What will you do with it? Will you make it a living sacrifice? Will you be prepared to be broken bread as Jesus was, poured out wine as Jesus was? May God help us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Part three in our series, A Living Sacrifice, Life Abundant and Full. A little bit later, we'll be hearing part four in this five-part series, Offering Yourself. First, though, we have a few minutes to hear from Rachel Saint. Rachel's brother, Nate, was one of the five missionaries killed in Operation Alka. She talks about her willingness to offer herself as a living sacrifice. A short time after starting to learn the language, her brother Nate was killed. But her desire to share the good news with the Walrani people was still strong. These comments from December of 1958 were included in an album about the Alka story that was released in 1962, largely through the efforts of missionary Nancy Wolnow, a missionary to Ecuador with HCJB Global. Here's Rachel Saint. Ten years ago when I was a student at the Summer Institute of Linguistics in the University of Oklahoma, the Lord called me to an unreached tribe with this verse, Those who have never been told of Him shall see, and those who have never heard shall understand. That verse led me out to answer the Lord's call. At about the same time the Lord called me, Dayuma, a young Alka Indian girl, fled the spear killings of her forest home and went to the outside. Her father had been killed, different relatives with machetes and spears, and she knew there was no future in living there because the tribal law calls for wiping out all of the family down to the youngest child who won't remember anymore. And so she had gone to the outside. Several years passed until I was sure that it was the Alka tribe that the Lord was leading me to. It was almost six years after I left my linguistic courses that the Lord led me to Dayuma there on the jungle plantation where she was living to begin a study of the Alka language. The door to the tribe seemed completely closed, but I promised the Lord that I would go just as far as he would let me. And so I began to study the language with Dayuma with the full assurance that someday the Lord would open the door to the tribe and to a translation of his word in the Alka language. 
And I remember very clearly that on New Year's Day of 1956, I prayed to the Lord, feeling I was the only one praying for the Alcas. And I asked the Lord to reach this tribe with me or without me, but to reach them. I told him I was willing to make any sacrifice that they might be reached, any personal sacrifice. I hadn't any idea how soon the Lord would hold me to my word. The next day was the very last day that I saw my young brother Nate and his four friends who were killed a few days later by Alka Spears on the Kudadai River. When Dayuma began to be willing to seek her people to tell them about the Lord, we prayed together that the Lord would show us where they lived and if they lived. And the very first thing that the Lord used to answer that prayer was the photographs that were brought back from Palm Beach, photographs taken by my own brother of Dayuma's own sister, though she didn't know it at the time. She recognized the older woman who was her aunt and thought she recognized the young man. But by that token, she knew that at least some of her family had escaped the spearings of the the hated chief Muipa who was trying to wipe them all out. Dayuma began to face the problem of going back with her aunts. She hated to get involved in the darkness, but finally on the basis of the fact that the Lord Jesus had come to earth for her, left heaven's glory, she was willing to leave the Christian environment in which she'd been living to go back to her people, and the three of them went back alone. In less than a month's time, they had come back to the outside with an invitation for us to go back to the Alka Indians. We arrived there on October 8, 1958, and spent almost two months with Dayuma's family. She saw her mother for the first time in more than 10 years. She had the joy of telling them about the living God in heaven and his son, Jesus, who died in exchange for the Alkas. She was the first one to tell them the name of Jesus in their own language, how we rejoiced and how the Lord had led. That was Rachel Saint, whose brother Nate was one of the five missionaries killed in Operation Alka. She and Elizabeth Elliott lived and worked with the Alka or Waldani people. Well, time now for A Living Sacrifice Part 4 on Gateway to Joy. We've heard about offering, acceptance, glory, and sharing. Think about an illustration of Galatians 2.20 and crucifixion with Christ. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not be afraid or dismayed. That promise given thousands of years ago by Moses to Joshua is for you and me today. For all of us who are willing to follow the Lord. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you again today about a living sacrifice. The sacrifice that Jesus made for you and me was for one purpose, to give us life. It's life abundant. We talked about four aspects of self-offering. The first is offering, giving ourselves to God. The next is acceptance of what God wants to give to us. The third is glory, the unimagined, unexpected, seemingly impossible joy that comes to us as we learn to offer and accept. And the fourth aspect of the principle of sacrifice is sharing. Jesus said the bread that I will give is my body, and I give it for the life of the world. He's given to you and me one body each, one body in which to live our lives. What will you do with it? Will you make it a living sacrifice? Will you be prepared to be broken bread as Jesus was? poured out wine, as Jesus was. Those people whose lives have had the deepest impact on my own were people who understood the principle of a living sacrifice, people who had given themselves to God unstintingly and without reservation, people who had accepted 
the place in which God had put them, the gifts which God had given to them, the sorrows, the sufferings, which were used as refining the gold in the fire, and people who knew the glory that comes out of that kind of self-offering, people who were able, because of all of that, to share with me, to be to me broken bread. Today, I want to begin with a very practical contemporary illustration. It comes from the letter from a dear 86-year-old widow who learned what it means to be crucified with Christ. She said, in today's broadcast, Elizabeth, you asked for contributions or illustrations on our idea of crucifixion with Christ from Galatians 2.20. That verse says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This widow says, I submit the following. I had a very good husband in every area of life. He often expressed his love for me and also told me so again and again. How we ladies like that. Now take note of that, gentlemen. We ladies do like to be told. Don't be like the man that said, I told you that on our wedding day and I've never rescinded it. We need to be told again and again. She says one of these love expressions was helping me do the dishes after the evening meal. We were farmers, both of us tired, and I thought it very kind and considerate of him. I'm sure I expressed my appreciation to him. But there came a time when I was doing dishes alone. Hubby was a busy person and he had many things to do. I understood, but I also was so self-centered I thought he should be in the kitchen at the sink with me. And when he saw fit to do otherwise, I thought he should be helping me. That big selfish self or I. I didn't say anything to my husband but looked to the Lord, took my place with him. I reckoned it to be that I was crucified with him. And Christ now was living in me. Self-centeredness was dead, crucified. The victory was mine by faith, and I was joyful within. I was so thankful I hadn't mentioned it to him. The above is just one little incident of how it works for me. There are a multitude of things which come up daily. I must keep near the cross, and maintain my position. Then the victory is mine. Now, Elizabeth, I've shared with you as I understand it and how it works for me. You may use this letter if it is fit. If you do, I'm sure you will in no way identify me. I may not hear it because sometimes I miss your broadcast. I'm 86 years old and a widow for 30 years, but I'm left with an abundance of precious memories I praise God for that daily. Well, thank you so much. No, I won't mention your name. God knows your name. And your testimony, I'm sure, has warmed the hearts of many of us. When you are forgotten or neglected or purposely put down and you don't sting and hurt with the insult or oversight, but your heart is happy, being counted worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self. Shall I read that again? This concept of crucifixion of the self is not an easy one. What does it mean to be crucified with Christ? What does it mean for you and me to be nailed to the cross? Well, here, here are practical illustrations. When you are forgotten or neglected, or purposely put down, and you don't respond by retaliation, even though your heart may sting, or if you don't insult the person who has put you down, if instead your heart is happy, being counted worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self. That's what it means. So I am grateful for this widow's letter Let's look at the principle of self-offering in the life of the Apostle Paul. In Philippians 2.17, Paul says, Even if I am to be poured out as a libation 
upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. We often use the expression, I feel like a wrung out dish rag. Can you identify with Paul's being poured out as a libation and a sacrificial offering? When you're living for other people, you will experience that. It's in following our Lord Jesus that we are to be a living sacrifice. It is in the willingness to be forgotten or neglected or set at naught or put down. And the Apostle Paul knew all about that, didn't he? He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. He was starved. He was imprisoned. But he said, It doesn't really make any difference if I am to be poured out as a libation on the sacrificial offering of your faith. I'm glad and rejoice with you all. I can imagine somebody saying, there is no way, Elizabeth Elliot, no way, no way, no way that you're going to make me rejoice in my sufferings. Well, you know, you're absolutely right. There is no way that Elizabeth Elliot can make you rejoice in your sufferings, but there is a way that God can. God's in the business of miracles. God can do anything. You know that little song, nothing is too difficult for thee, nothing is too difficult for thee. I can't remember the rest of it. I learned it in England, I think, the first time. But it's true, and it's not too difficult for God to teach you and me this principle of self-offering. He taught it to the Apostle Paul, and remember the Apostle Paul had a dramatic conversion, a total turnaround from a man who persecuted Christians and even killed them to a man who held up the message of the cross. In his epistle to Timothy, second epistle, verse 6 in chapter 2, he said, As for me, already my life is being poured out on the altar, and the hour for my departure is upon me. In another translation, the same verse is put this way, I feel that the last drops of my life are being poured out for God. And yet another says, I am already on the point of being sacrificed. In the book of Colossians, he says, it is my happiness to suffer for you. This is my way of helping to complete in my poor human flesh the full tale of Christ's afflictions still to be endured for the sake of his body, which is the church. And that's love. That's what I'm talking about, this living sacrifice. It was God's purpose before the foundation of the world. We were chosen to be full of love. He destined us to be full of love and to be accepted as his sons through Jesus Christ in order that the glory of his gracious gift so graciously bestowed on us and his beloved might redound to his praise. I hope that I'm talking to more than one who from the depths of your heart, wants to be this kind of a living sacrifice, that the glory of his gracious gift so graciously bestowed on us in his beloved Son might redound to his praise. We're meant to be vessels, dedicated, offered. Let's make sure that we see that this is not mere theology. It may sound far too intricate, for our little minds to comprehend. But the Spirit of God is here to guide us, to teach us, to lead us into truth. Lord, I pray now that you will open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to grasp. Help us to apply this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Part four in the five-part series, A Living Sacrifice, Offering Yourself. Well, as you've thought about sacrifice today, the sacrifice of the five men, of Rachel Saint and Elizabeth Elliot living and working with the Alka people, let's take a short break to hear from Elizabeth once again as she talks about the purpose of Gateway to Joy. It's no easy task to figure out what in the world to talk about to people who listen to me on the radio. I'm not assuming that all of you do by any means, but a good number of you do. And if you've been listening for any length of time, you know that you hear the same things over and over and over. And it comes down always to two 
simple words, trust and obey. Believe that God is faithful and do what he says. And I do believe that that is the only way, as the old gospel hymn says, trust and obey for there's what? No other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And with that, our time together is almost at an end. Thanks for letting us come into your home, your office, along with you. She took that walk wherever we found you. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. More devotionals, videos, and other resources. Check it out, elizabethelliot.org. At last report, there were about 50,000 subscribers to the podcast. Thank you for spreading the word. Nasital via Apple Podcasts had a quick note. I am truly blessed to have found Elizabeth Elliot. Even more blessed to be able to use Apple Podcasts to hear her while I drive. Thank you so much. If you get a chance, leave a review for us. Thanks. Until next time, may God remind you each and every day that you are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are those everlasting arms. <laughs>